Quicker Upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker and is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. Bounty, the Quicker Picker Upper. What do you want? How much you want for her? This child is not for sale. Here is your first look at Tom Hanks in his first Western. Happening now. Unlike other Texas counties, Bear County doesn't track wait times at area polling places. That's where technology comes in. How social media and an app are helping voters track wait times at polling sites. It's the final debate before the election. I'm Nadia Romero in Nashville. I'll break down the big topics you can expect to hear on the debate stage tonight. And I have some big updates to both cold fronts that are on the way. I'll have the very latest coming right up. As part of our Day of the Dead celebration, we'll tell you all about two of Mexico's most iconic people, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, and their impact on Day of the Dead. The News at Five starts right now. First at five, the countdown to the November 3rd general election continues. And with less than two weeks to go, Bear County has already seen more than 325,000 people vote in person over the last nine days of early voting. The record turnouts since early voting began are encouraging, but not so much for those who don't have time to wait in line. A woman who says it only took her 30 minutes to vote saw complaints on Facebook and decided she could do something about that. Jessica Yellow tells us what the voter did and the response she's getting as a result. There is now a Facebook group focused on what many have been wondering about. Bear County voting location wait times. There's nothing sexy about it. Seeing how long lines could discourage people wanting to vote early gave Lily Kasuda an idea. Let's do it as a Facebook group and let's have people crowdsource the wait times in real time. They certainly have been posting where and when the shortest waits are across Bear County. Based on those, the average is said to be only 10 minutes. Afternoons are better than mornings, as well as right before the early voting sites close at 8 p.m. What kind of response have you gotten? Well, in a little over a week, it's up to 6,000 members, which is incredible. It just showed me there's a, a real need for more grassroots help that's middle of the road, impartial, but useful. We checked whether this post was accurate about no one in line at this east side location being worth the drive. Sure enough, there was no line to the relief of these voters who weren't aware of the Facebook group. Sometimes we can't stand as long as we could when we were younger and we need more help. So, you know, I think it's great. There's also now an app that mirrors much of what the Facebook page does, created by Move Texas, a nonpartisan grassroots organization. Being that it's still new, creators of the app say the more people use it, the more information it'll have, both giving voters the heads up on what to expect and plan for. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. A false tip. It's why the Bear County Sheriff's Office has called off the search for 38-year-old Curtis Perry at a property in East Bear County. The Sheriff's Office had been searching that property on Home Green Road since Tuesday. Today's Sheriff Javier Salazar says he believes the suspect who provided the information did so in hopes it would help his own case. Perry was last seen in July when he was being chased in a neighborhood near Foster Road. His car and cell phone were later found on Foster Road, both riddled with bullets. The sheriff says while this particular search has been called off, they will continue investigating Perry's disappearance. New at five, a chase in Fayette County ends with two people dead. And investigators say the vehicle was stolen from San Antonio. It happened yesterday along I-10. The Fayette County Sheriff's Office says the driver was avoiding a traffic stop and tried passing an 18-wheeler on the emergency shoulder, but ended up losing control and then rolling the vehicle. Two men were ejected. Neither have been identified. We now know the name of a motorcyclist found dead in South Bear County on Tuesday. He's been identified as 57 year old Joseph Staggs. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says a driver heading northbound on Highway 16 near Jet Road had to swerve to avoid a crashed motorcycle in the middle of the road. Staggs body was found not too far away. It is unclear what caused that crash. 
We've also learned the name of 51 year old man who was killed after he stepped out into traffic last night. He's been identified as Juan Antonio Martinez. San Antonio police say at around eight o'clock last night, he was hit by a driver near Calabria and Zarzamora Street. The driver was unable to avoid hitting him. Meantime, we're still working to learn the name of another man killed while crossing West Commerce at North San Joaquin last night. San Antonio police say this man was not using a crosswalk when he was hit by an SUV. He died at the hospital. Just 12 days to go till one of the biggest days in politics. After months of campaigning and garnering supporters, President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden will have one more chance to sway voters in the second and final debate. Tonight's debate is in Nashville, Tennessee, and with the new city comes new rules, it appears. Nadia Romero with details about how tonight's matchup will look a little different. Former Vice President Joe Biden doing, and President Donald Trump meeting on stage for the first time since this chaotic scene in Cleveland. You know, it, and that gives you socialized Trump. Totally President Trump. Trump. You both had two minutes, sir. Looking to avoid a repeat, the Commission on Presidential Debates now says they will mute each candidate's mic, allowing their opponent two uninterrupted minutes for each of the six key issues on the docket. We think that this decision is in the best interest of the people of the United States. As for how the president will respond. The topics themselves, I'd say he's going to answer those topics, but he's also going to, frankly, answer the questions he wants to. And in a preview of what issues could be front and center, President Trump was asked about a potential second term in an interview with 60 Minutes. The what do you priority have to now solve? is to get back to normal, get back to where we were, to have the economy rage and be great with jobs and everybody be happy. And that's where we're going. Biden, meanwhile, could be asked about potential court expansion in the wake of the rush to fill the Supreme Court vacancy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. If elected, what I will do is I'll put together a national commission and I will uh, ask them to over uh, 180 days come back to me with recommendations as to how to uh, reform the court system. The debate will play out over 90 minutes, moderated by NBC's Kristen Welker. So when you look at this debate, this is the last chance for voters to see both of the candidates side by side. Now, about 43 million Americans have already participated in early voting. That includes about 5.8 million Texans. But there are still some folks that are trying to figure out who to vote for. And that's specifically moderate Republicans and people who voted for President Obama in 2012, but then voted for President Trump in 2016. Live from Nashville, I'm Nadia Romero. Steve, back to you. Nadia, before we let you go, with only 12 days left in this race, where did the candidates stand in the polls, specifically those key battleground states? Yeah, well, in most pollings overall, you're seeing Joe Biden with a double-digit lead over President Trump. When you look in battleground states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Florida, that's where Joe Biden still has an edge in every category except the economy, where President Trump has a slight advantage. But I know that you and Ursula, Steve, have talked a lot about Texas and, and how that could be a battleground state. Could we add that to the list? Right now, a Quinnipiac poll, the most recent one, shows a tie between Joe Biden and President Trump. This is something that we'll definitely have to keep an eye on on as we near election day. See? Should be an interesting debate tonight. Thank you, Nadia. Appreciate your time. In 10 more days. If you haven't voted yet early, time is ticking and the early voting period ends next week. You have until Friday, October 30th to cast your ballot early. Otherwise, you have to wait till election day. And right now on KSAT.com, you can find your nearest polling site. They're open until 8 o'clock tonight. Again, early voting ends October 30th. Election day is November 3rd. It was another ditto day. More of the same, but big changes are on the way. And it looks like uh, the cold front that's going to greet us tomorrow will be a little stronger than we previously anticipated. So all of that full update in a moment. First of all, here and now, we've had a few showers out there, especially along the coastal plain uh, throughout the afternoon and even midday hours. But a lot of that activity is coming to an end. Uh, consider yourself lucky if you had a hit of rain there especially closer to the coastline. 89 Del Rio, 90 now in Floresville, 86 Leon Springs, Lakey at 88. It's just like the past several afternoons. Utopia at 90 along with Seguin. As we go through the evening, increasing humidity, increasing clouds overnight tonight. The cold front is expected to arrive by tomorrow afternoon. I'll help you prepare for it, let you know what it's going to be like even for Friday night football because things will be changing for that. 
And then our second cold front that hits on Monday. Let you know how much cooler it's gonna get coming right up. Thank you, Adam. The latest now on the 2020 census. For the second time, a federal court has ruled against excluding undocumented immigrants from the census count. That move would have impacted the process of divvying up seats for Congress. Last month, a federal court in New York blocked the same measure. The Trump administration, though, appealed the decision, and the Supreme Court is expected to hear arguments next month. It is unclear if the administration will appeal today's decision as well. The pharmaceutical company Moderna announcing it's on track to finish enrollment this month for phase three of its coronavirus vaccine study. The company says it will price its vaccine under $40 for most people. That's a big difference from what biotech Gilead Sciences plans to charge for its own treatment, remdesivir. Today, the drug was approved by the FDA to be used as a COVID-19 treatment. In June, Gilead Sciences said one vial of the drug would cost more than $500 for people with private health insurance. While cough and shortness of breath and fever are what we most know about COVID-19 symptoms, the CDC also is listing new loss of taste or smell as another common one. But unlike a fever, some of those suffering from this latest symptom can feel the effect even months after the diagnosis. These three first lost their sense of smell when they were diagnosed with COVID-19. But even after recovery, they're still feeling the symptoms effects. The chicken itself, uh, it's almost nauseating. <laughs> when I smell it now, it smells like um, like burnt tires. In a July study published in the JAMA Network, researchers found about 90% of patients surveyed who lost their sense of smell or taste improved or recovered within a month. But nearly 11% said that the symptom was unchanged or worse. I went from no smell to like maybe two, three weeks of mild smells returning. And then the smell went from coming like returning gradually, like slowly, mildly, to just taking a very bad turn. It's been about three weeks since I've been smelling that burning plastic smell when I eat or shower or brush my teeth. You go through that, maybe it's just a weird day, maybe something is spoiled, maybe the coffee is rancid, maybe, you know, and then you realize like it's not, you know, I thought there was something going on in my house. I really thought something died in my garage. While we continue to learn more about COVID-19, researchers say more studies are needed to determine how the virus has an effect on those senses. What an uncomfortable side effect, right? One study published in the journal eLife in July found that people who tested positive for COVID-19 are 27 times more likely to lose their sense of smell than those who simply tested negative, making it more of an indicator that you have the virus than the other symptoms like fever. The smell test. The smell test. Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. Diego Rivera, they are names that ring a bell. It's for a good reason. The iconic couple dedicated their lives to activism and art. They made a lasting impact on Mexican culture. Up next, we take a look at how they shaped Mexican identity and their influence on Day of the Dead. Whether it was through their art or their activism, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera made their mark on Mexican culture. E.C. Romero tells us a little more about the duo and their influence on Day of the Dead and Beyond. They are found in everything from art to currency to t-shirts. Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera two of Mexico's most impactful figures. You know, um, their stories are so integral to what has happened in terms of Mexican identity, but also Mexican-American identity, maybe even in a broader sense, Latinx identities. Diego Rivera, known for his iconic murals, Frida Kahlo for her profound self-portraits, both notable artists in their own right, 
and also together as a couple. People who, who understood their artwork as having a social message and wanting to use it to raise awareness and critique and even present a vision of something kind of better. So they were a duo in terms of what they stood for and represented and how they used their, their art. Their influence seen during Day of the Dead and beyond. Frida and Diego brought it into focus with their work, the way that they incorporated imagery out of indigenous origins and celebrated folk traditions like Dia de los Muertos. Um, so you will find in, in many of the most you know, legendary paintings of, of both Carlo and, and Rivera, these um, images of uh, skulls and, and calacas and skeletons of various natures. They, their impact was broader than just what they put on the canvas. It was, um, they contributed to like intellectual conversations of that day, which I think lends to their legacy. Isis Romero, KSAT 12 News. Coming up tomorrow during our 6 o'clock newscast, we're going to take you inside Casa Azul, the former home of Frida Kahlo, and explore one of Mexico's most historic boroughs. And of course, coming up next week on October 30th, one week from tomorrow, the Day of the Dead River Parade goes virtual. Join us for a night of celebration and culture from 8 until 10 p.m. Live look outside with Sky 12, right over another historic treasure there, the Alamo. Uh, beautiful day out there, only one person walking by, socially distanced. Yeah, there's that more activity oh, there out there. There we go, like the, the Couple widening families. of the view there. But uh, we're waiting on a cold front, Adam. And not just one, Steve, but... Oh, that's two right. Cold we have fronts. two. All right. Yeah, we'll have two cold fronts. The first one's going to be hitting us by tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, and the second will be early next week. And it's going to have a big impact on our temperatures. I think we'll still make it into the 80s tomorrow, but then by Saturday, we'll probably be stuck in the 60s for afternoon highs, only to go back upward to fall off again. So we'll take a closer look at those temperatures and the timing of the changes coming right up. But let's talk about today as well. 90 degrees, the high temperature. Record challenging out there. We missed the record by one degree. 91 is the record set back in 1933. And of course, our morning low of 73, well above average for this time of year by a good 14 degrees. Right now we're at 89. We have some of those fair weather clouds overhead and actually a few of those clouds threw out some showers earlier today. Highly isolated, but especially east of I-35 and closer to the coastline. A few folks were lucky and fortunate to get a few of the showers, but we just couldn't squeeze much out of them here in town other than a few little sprinkles. That was it. 91 in Pleasanton, 90 in Hondo, 93 Catula. This map looks the same as it did the past couple of days at this hour across the state. No big changes for now, but by this time tomorrow, we're going to see a big temperature drop off across Texas and a big contrast. And you see it right here. See the blue colors indicating the cooler temperatures well below average, and then the orange indicating the warmer temperatures where we are, which is, as I mentioned, record challenging. There's the cold front. That's cold front number one. It's going to drag some of this cooler air southward, and it, we're really going to feel the effects by Friday night and especially into Saturday. So tomorrow, I still think we'll make it into the 80s, into the early afternoon. But by football time and sunset, you'll really see that temperature fall off and the wind pick up. That leaves us in the upper 60s on Saturday, only to rebound again into the 80s on Sunday. It's like Mother Nature is just confused and can't decide what to do because then we fall back off again into next week. And it looks like the majority of next week will just be more fall like with some high temperatures in the upper 60s. Let's talk rain chances. I mentioned we had some of that activity along, especially the coastal plain earlier today. The overall pattern shows more snow within that unseasonably cold air to the north and the jet streams a little to the north of us as well. That's going to change a little bit and that's going to help us out in terms of rain chances. Not only does that pull some of the cooler air southward next week, but we'll have a nice cutoff upper level low setting up to the west of us. That's pretty good positioning. We prefer them in northern Mexico, but this isn't all that bad. So by early next week on Monday, cold front moves in and we'll start to generate some upper level support as well. I'm not anticipating any drought denting rainfall necessarily, 
but a few hit or miss showers here and there, and at least some rain chances of scattered activity into next week. So tomorrow, 72 and cloudy in the morning, 10% chance of a few showers. By 5 p.m., we'll be in these upper 70s. 9 p.m., right near 60 degrees and really quickly falling off with a gusty wind. And then we get into next week and a good chunk of the week should be spent with highs only in the mid and upper 60s. Wow, that is a roller coaster. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adam. All right, this particular cowboy player has been great when he's been on the field. Yeah. But he hasn't been on the field all and that And they much. need him healthy, and they need him on the field now for this Dallas D. When we come back, he says he's almost ready to return. Just how close, we'll ask him. And Randall Cobb's reunion with the Green Bay Packers when we come back. I got the beard, I'm rocking it. You know, when Travis retired, I said, somebody's got to hold the beard game up. So <laughs> I don't think I'm doing him justice, but I'm trying. All right, Sean Lee's new look is hoping to help him restart his football career with the Cowboys sooner than later in big board sports. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. If the Cowboys need one player back to help them turn around their disastrous season, especially on defense, it would be Sean Lee, a leader on and off the field for the past 10 seasons. His positivity is just what the Dallas team needs after giving up 218 points in the first six games. Lee has been unable to help on the field after having sports hernia surgery during the offseason that kept him out of most of training camp and now all of the games this season. And what makes it more of a shame is he's coming off his first season wearing the star where he was able to play in all 16 games. In his first meeting with the media, Lee was asked if he thought his football career might have been over going into surgery. I dealt with this a little bit last year, and then in the training period before camp, it, it progressed and got worse. And, you know, the thought was, okay, maybe it'll heal. So we worked on it hard for three, four weeks, and it just never got to a point where we, we could play with it. So anytime you get surgery, you don't know what's going to be on the back end of that. Um, the surgeon did an unbelievable job, Dr. Myers. Um, the rehab has been incredible with the trainers, and, I, and I've been really happy that I'm able to come back and, and, and hopefully help here soon. Lee also blasted anonymous sources used by the NFL Network that said the coaches are unprepared. Lee says there is no finger pointing. When the Houston Texans host the Green Bay Packers this Sunday at noon in an NRG Stadium, it will be a reunion for Texans' new wide receiver Randall Cobb. He'll be going up against a team he played with for eight seasons before he signed with the Dallas Cowboys for one year last season, now the Houston Texans for the next three. It's a little weird. Actually, you know, I was in Dallas last year and we played the Packers. It was a very weird feeling after being in Green Bay for eight years, um, you know, giving everything to that, that organization to play them. It was a little, it was weird being on the other sidelines, but, you know, uh, it's, it's a new year, a different situation. And really, we're just looking to go one and zero this week. Cobb has three catches for 53 yards when he faced the Packers as a Cowboy. Now going into Sunday's game, he has 277 yards and two touchdowns. The Las Vegas Raiders have placed five players on the COVID-19 reserve list, including their entire offensive line, but will still play their game against Tampa Bay. Only that game has been moved to Sunday afternoon. We're placed on Sunday night football with Seattle and Arizona. I cannot believe they're still playing the game, and it's Thursday. <laughs> It really comes down to do you want to delay it or do you want to play it? And I guess they decided let's play. And I guess they have enough guys in reserve to do it. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll if, see. You're, if you're the quarterback, you're maybe more concerned than anybody else exactly. right now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What a strange year this has been. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for watching the News at 5 with us. World News is up next. We'll see you back here at 6 o'clock.